Dearest God, we are sometimes preoccupied with our own concerns and worries. Lift us now into praise as we study the Gloria and the Liturgy of the Word. Give us a new understanding and appreciation for your Word and how the Bible connects us with your lived connects with our lived experience. We ask this through Christ our Lord. All right, last week, um, what was it that we were looking at? Does anybody remember? Okay, the introductory rites. And the center of the introductory rites is what? Pardon? Yes, the penitential act. Okay. We used to call it the penitential rite. Now it will be called an act because it's not just a rite, it's also an action. How many forms are there to the penitential act? How many different forms? Three. Three, A, B, and C. And what's the one that we really don't use much today? B, yeah. A is which? That's the easy one. Yeah, I confess, the confusion here. Uh, C is the one that we use most Sundays. There's some kind of acclamation, Lord have mercy, Christ. So C is not going to change. A will change a little bit. B, if you recall, was the one that's going to change the most. And starting with the first Sunday in Advent, when we start using this, New translation, which form are we going to be using? B. Yeah. So that we kind of get used to it, so it becomes part of um, those parts of the Mass that we're familiar with. We looked also at the scriptural basis for each one of those penitential um, acts. And then what follows the penitential act? Pardon? The opening prayer. Yeah, the opening prayer. Or what are we going to be calling it? The collect or the colic. I grew up hearing it being called the colic, so that's what I. Um, I don't know why. This is spelled like colic. Mm -hmm. It's spelled the exact same way. Um, and it's. Why do we call it the colic or collect? All the prayers of the people. Exactly. It's all the prayers of the people who have assembled to worship God. We're collecting those prayers together to present them to God. Now, are there any questions about what we covered last week? Yes. Was there any rhyme or reason as to which penitential act to use? Or is it just your choice? Okay, yeah, there's a. Well, it's a good question. Is there a reason for the penitential act that is chosen? What do you think? That's what I'm asking you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what do the rest of you think? So it depends on the priest sometimes. It's, it's dependent upon the priest, but even with the individual priest, what is it? What sh right, let me step back. What should it be dependent upon? It could be season, it could be theme. There's a whole bunch of different things that come into play. One of the things that we have this impression sometimes that because we have the book, let me go grab it. And what is this book currently called? No, the lectionary is the reading. Yeah. Sacramentary. What is it going to be called? The Roman Missal. That's what it used to be called. The Roman Missal is actually both the sacramentary and the lectionary together. How many of you have not or ever had 
a hand missile, one of those. Okay? What did it have in there? <clears throat> Just the readings? No, it had the, the whole form of the mass. Yeah, it had the mass and it had the readings. It, it had everything in it. Okay, so it was a hand missile. It's the hand version of all of this stuff for mass. Okay? So we're going back to the original title, in part because you know what? That's still the word they use in other languages. In Italy, there was no Italian version of sacramentary. It was called Missale. So basically we're getting on the same page as the rest of the world. And when it comes to the Mass, you know, everything is in here. We used to, liturgy committees used to have this idea, well, what is a liturgy committee about? Well, we plan the liturgy. Well, no, <laughs> the liturgy is planned. Okay? We have the prayers, the readings already laid out for us. And so we have this concept sometimes that, okay, Father just goes up there and flips the book open to the appropriate page and starts going at it. What people don't understand is Father really needs to prepare himself for Mass. Let's take a simple little thing like, you know what the preface is? What is a preface? Pardon? An introduction. Like an introduction. Where does the preface come in the Mass? I'll give you a hint. The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your heart. So where does that come? It's a preface to what? Yeah, it's a preface to the Eucharistic prayer. It's the introduction to the Eucharistic prayer. Okay? Just so you can see. Preface 29, Sundays in Ordinary Time, all the way through Preface 36, Sundays in Ordinary Time, 8. So there's 8 possibilities for a preface on any Sunday. Or like last week where I used Eucharistic Prayer 4, that would be a ninth one because Eucharistic Prayer 4 has its own preface. So Father has to decide which one of these prefaces really fits with the readings, the homilies, the prayers of the faithful, all of those sorts of things. So can a, father, can a priest, a celebrant, come up there and just do a right from the book? Yes, you can. But if you want liturgy well done, then you got to spend some time looking at these things. Another simple little thing, and I don't know whether we're going to have this with the new translation or not, but if you look on any Sunday in ordinary time, you have opening prayer, and then you have alternative opening prayer. So Father has to decide which one of these prayers. Here's a little secret. When you hear me conclude that opening prayer with, we ask this for our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. That's opening prayer one. When I conclude it, we ask this through Christ our Lord, that's the alternative opening prayer. Okay, so a little secret. Sometimes I use the first one, sometimes I use the second. Again, depending on the readings, the homily, all of these sorts of things, how they fit together. Because you want to have a liturgy that flows, not something that kind of jerks around and goes in different directions. So that's kind of the long uh, answer to your question is, uh, yes, it's dependent on the priest, but it's in the context of the larger picture, which one fits. Now, I've made the decision already to use the second form, form B, because we need to learn it. So it will make for better liturgy in the long term. So short term, that's the one we're going to be using initially. Uh, even though sometimes maybe there's another one that might fit a little bit 
better as far as with the, the readings and such, because we're at the beginning of a learning curve, um, we need to bring that and kind of focus on it for a while, okay? Any other questions? That's a great question. Any other questions? Okay. Tonight, we are going to be looking at the piece of the introduction, the introductory rights that we didn't look at last week. Namely, the glory. Okay? The glory, you remember what we talked about, at least those of you who were here on Sunday at the end of Mass, we talked a little bit about the glory. Do you remember what the Gloria is? Definition of the Gloria. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah, who is it that on uh, Welcome Back Potter used to do that? <laughs> the angels sang. Okay, the angels sang. That's where we got it from. What is it? A praise. An announcement. Announcement? It's not a song. It's not found in... A song or hymn, yeah. A hymn is a song of praise. So it is a hymn of praise. It's an ancient hymn in the church. And it comes, the first part of it comes from the angels. And I didn't go through um, tonight to look at, there are other phrases in the Gloria that come directly from Scripture. But certainly that's the first one is the announcement of Jesus' birth from the angel. So oftentimes it's referred to as the angelic hymn. When we say it's a hymn, what conclusion can we draw from that? Exactly. It is to be sung. Now, can we recite it? Yes, we can. But... The default position, the normal mode of praying the Gloria is sung. So we call it a hymn of praise because in God, or I mean in, in the Gloria, we praise God. How do we praise God in the Gloria? I believe you have... In your books, on page 14, you have, they call it the previous translation, or the current translation, versus the new translation. So how are the ways that we praise God in the Gloria? I've decided to go old school, uh, instead of all of that technology with the computer, um, go back to the butcher paper, the whiteboard, the chalkboard. It's what I'm most comfortable with. Did your computer fix? Why well, the computer works. Um, I, last week I had lost the the program, or not the program, but the uh, file. So I think God was telling me. So what are the ways that we praise God in the glory as you're looking at it? Don't we talk about, one of the things we talk about the, <laughs> wonderful things God has done. Can you give me an example of one of the wonderful things that's found in the Gloria that uh, God has done? Take away the sins of the world. Exactly. Perfect. Okay. What other ways do we praise God? Okay. 
Um, how, what would we call that? Son of the Father. So one of the things that we're doing is, one of the ways that we're praising him is we're describing him, aren't we? And more than anything else, what we're looking at there is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Okay? Okay? We're acknowledging Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We're acknowledging the Trinity. We're describing also, I would say, what do we use? We say things like Heavenly King, Almighty God, and Father. Okay. Aren't those descriptions of praise? Okay. How else do we praise God? So there's one more basic way. Okay, we're giving thanks. Um, that's kind of what we're doing, though, isn't it? Which is important. Um, How are we, what are we asking of God? Just have mercy. All receive. Yeah, receive our prayer, have mercy. And if you look in the new translation, you have all of those elements, don't you? Now, what I'd like to do is we're going to split you up for this next exercise. If you look in your book on page 14, you have the old, the current translation and the new translation. So here's what I'd like to do. You folks are going to be the current, or what they describe here as the previous translation. You folks are going to be the new translation. And if you look, the glory is broken up like into four segments. You see that? Okay. So what I'd like to do is first, the current translation. Here you folks, listen to yourselves. You listen to them. Pray that first segment. And then I'd like you folks to pray that first segment with the new translation. And again, listen to yourselves. Listen to the difference. And then we'll go the second segment, the second segment, the third, the third, the fourth, the fourth. Okay? But if we sing it, they will be better. Yes. Um... We could do that, except I'm not familiar enough with the dad's not here. I thought that's why we were in church. We were going to sing the glory. <laughs> that's what I get. No, actually, this Sunday, you know what you're starting on this Sunday? You did so well with the Gloria. Guess what you're going to do this Sunday? The creed, yeah. yeah. That's cheating. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> easy research. Okay. Yeah, if I'm going to sit in front, I'm going to cheat. Okay, why don't you folks begin? Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace to his people of goodwill. Lord God, the heavenly King, Almighty God and Father. We worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. We praise you, we bless you, we adore you, we glorify you. We give you thanks for your great glory. Lord God, Heavenly King, O 
Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. like a statement of fact, isn't it? Where the second one, there's a little more majestic. I'm sorry? Majestic. majestic. Yeah, that's the word. There's something more majestic. Good, good word. There's something more majestic about the second one, isn't there? It's, there's something awesome and reverent about it. Um, you know, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. You take away the sins of the world, receive our prayer. You are seated at the right hand. Now, there are some things, if you look at the last part, I don't know if any of you picked it up. What's the difference? There's nothing. Okay? So it's not like we threw everything out. But in the parts where we are needy, where we're asking, it, yes. it, it makes it bigger. You know, that the old translation to me, and I don't want to say that it's bad, but it more watered no. down. The well, it's, it's a little more, are, yeah, it's like a matter of fact. It's a statement rather than. Rather than we have a need for you to have mercy on us. Yeah, yeah. Sense of humility. There's, you know yes. what, there's a, another good point. There's a sense of humility in the second, isn't there? He is God. We are His people. If you look also, go to that second segment. Lord God, Heavenly King, Almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. It's like, ba bum, ba bum, ba bum, ba bum. Here's all of the things we're going to do. And the new one, we praise you, we bless you. We adore you. 
we glorify you. It's almost like you're building, isn't it? It's, it's almost like to a crescendo. And then notice, in the first one, we give you thanks. For what? What are we giving thanks to God for? It really doesn't say, does it? But in the second, the, the new translation, it does. We thank, we give you thanks for your great glory. We're thankful that you're God. That doesn't really reflect that in the first one, does it? Now, keep in mind, this new translation is building upon our current translation, okay? So we have the wisdom of the 40, 50 years after the Second Vatican Council, something that you didn't have. It's a different style. It was more of a dynamic translation. Let's get to the meat of it. Where now we're saying, we can find some meat in poetry. We can find some meat in majesty. We can find some meat in that sense of humility. What pieces are missing from the previous translation that we have in the uh, in the second, the new translation? What are the things that are left out? Because the, the second one is basically a more of a literal translation from the Latin. As you're looking at it, what's missing? The repetition of the sins of the world section. Okay, one of the things is there's this repetition here. Yeah. Okay, what else? Begotten Son. Okay, begotten. Only Son, only begotten Son. We're making a statement. That's something else we're going to. But look at it. We worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. We praise you, we bless you, we adore you, we glorify you. We give you thanks. If you look in the one that we're currently using, there's no bless there, is there? There is no we adore you, is there? There is no we glorify you, is there? Instead, we kind of lump that together and we say we worship you. So what we're doing now is kind of expanding out a little bit on that we worship you. We're being a little more specific about what we mean when we say we worship you. <clears throat> uh, let me move quickly to the sin versus sins. Change. Yeah, we can. Okay, let's look at what is the difference between sin and sins here? What do we mean when we say sin? What do we mean when we say sins? Isn't sin like, more like the original sin, or sin is like the now sin? Which one? Which one is the left? The sin, the, sin, the, the, the singular, is what? Like original sin? Yeah. And there's like sin. Like and this one is personal sin. So we're going from this kind of concept of, okay, you took away original sin, to you're taking away my sins. It personalizes what Jesus does for us, doesn't it? This is a little more cold. Not to say it's invalid, but it's a little more obscure. It's kind of out there, nebulous. We start talking about personal sins. That has a direct personal effect on us, doesn't it? So now we're moving from that idea of God just taking away sin, or another another translation would be evil. You take away evil. Okay? Duke, you're taking away my sins. You're doing something for me. 
it makes the worship a little more personal, doesn't it? This is one of those ways, you know, people like that intimacy in the worship. And we've kind of fallen into this bad habit of doing all of these kind of funky things to make it more personal, to make it more meaningful. And for years, I've been looking at saying, and I, I can't tell you how many discussions I've had with my buddy Father Jim when we were in Muskegon about this stuff that, you know, there's nothing lacking in the Mass. It's not incomplete. We don't have to add anything to it. It has it. The problem is sometimes we don't understand it, which is one of the blessings of this new translation because it brings all of this forward. It gives us an opportunity to understand there's something really intimate about this, isn't there? Because who knows the sins that I have committed? God and God alone. It doesn't get more intimate than that, does it? Okay. One of the things that we noticed, uh, we're going from only son to only begotten son. What's the difference? And don't tell me it's just the word begotten. <laughs> I want to say it's because we're all sons and daughters, but we are not begotten. They're very, very good. That's, that's an excellent point. Um, well, it's true. That's exactly it. We are, we are God's children. So all of us men here can say we're sons of God. Now, we're not the only son of God. When we use this phrase, only son of God, yes, we mean Jesus Christ. But isn't this a little more precise? And it goes to our teaching on the Trinity. We will look at it next week. We talk about, currently in our translation of the Creed, proceeds from the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit. He's the love between the Father and the Son. But we talk in terms of the Father having begotten the Son. What does begotten mean? In Latin, it's unigenite. It comes from the word beget. What does beget mean? Part of? Um, not directly. Actually, we will see that uh, in a little different form in the Creed next week. Well, isn't that a word that actually means, you know, in, in, when, you when you're not talking about the Trinity, you know, you can say David begot Solomon. Yeah, and we use that term, don't we? Right. Okay. So, yeah, the, in other words, give me a synonym for begot or beget. Father. Okay. Son. Father. Son. Another one. Descended. How about something like produced, caused, all of these things. What we're saying is there's a connection between the Son and the Father. If the Father had not had the Son, if he... If the Father does not beget the Son, He's not the Father, is He? And if the Son is not begotten by the Father, He's not the Son. So, this word begotten, in a sense, goes to the relationship
between the Father and the Son. But doesn't that, um, couldn't you draw from that then that the Father would have to be before the Son? No. Well, yeah, you can look at it in terms of chicken and the egg. One, when you look at chicken and the egg, you have to look at one coming first. Either the chicken came first or the egg came first. They didn't come at the same time. If the Father is always the Father from eternity, then the Son always had to be there, didn't he? The Father did not become the Father. The Father always was the Father. And the Son was always the Son. Thus we call it the mystery. Yes. <laughs> yes. Thus we call it the mystery. Well, there's. it's hard to explain some of these things if you don't have kind of a philosophical foundation. That's one of the reasons why um, in the seminaries, at least in my day, and, and they've gone back to it now, they teach philosophy. You study philosophy for two years. Because to really understand theology, Trinitarian theology especially, you have to have a good founding in philosophy. Otherwise, it's, it's too hard to understand. Perhaps, uh, just notes, John's Gospel, the beginning of the book. Yes. The Word was God. The Word was God, and the Word was the with God. Without him was not anything that was made. Yes, yeah. And he was not made. So, co-existing from the very beginning. Someone said, Here is the mystery. What do we call the Son? We refer to him as not just the Son, but also the Word. And it comes exactly from John's Gospel. It's the word logos, that's Greek for word. Traditionally, what you will see now, there's times when they do it a little bit differently. If you had and then you had what's the difference? I'm sorry. Can you see the difference here? Word and the Word of God. Yeah, you've got the Word of God and the Word of God. Capital W. What's the difference? The Word refers to the second person of the Trinity. But Which one of these refers to the second person of the Trinity? When you say the Word, but the Word of God can also be the second person of the Trinity too, but it's, it's, it's an expression okay, of God. What, what, what is this, the Word of God, what does this mean? It's God's expression of himself. And it's, mm -mm. Uh, no, not the like Bible, you mean? What is the Think top math. Is scripture. Math. Yeah. The top yeah. one is scripture. Exactly. The top one, the word of God is what do we say at the end of our readings? The, the word of the Lord, don't we? Okay? So this is scripture. The word of God with a small W is scripture. The word of God with a capital W is Jesus. the Son. Okay? Going back to John's Gospel with Logos. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. Okay? So from the beginning. Again, I it's something I would encourage you to continue to delve into. It's not something we can spend uh, a lot of time on. But what's important, I think, is to see that we're, we're being a little more precise. We're talking about a relationship here when we talk about the only begotten Son. Okay? Now, when do we pray the Gloria? For example, I'm not looking at where does it fall at the Mass. Do we pray the Gloria like... Every Thursday. What is it that we pray the Gloria? Every Sunday, except 
Okay. So we pray the Gloria. Sundays. Accept. Advent. And Lent. Because those are penitential times. Any other time that we do the Gloria? When is Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Give me an example of a solemnity. Corpus Christi. Corpus Christi. Although for us that falls on a Sunday because we've, we've uh, All Saints Day. All Saints Day. Matter of Conception. The Annunciation. When is the Annunciation? March 25th. Pardon? March 25th. Yes, March 25th. Why March 25th? Nine months before Christmas. Very good. Nine months before Christmas. Okay. So we have these solemnities like All Saints Day. Christmas fell on a Saturday, didn't it? Did we or did we not do the Gloria? Yes. Wasn't that many weeks ago, was it? <laughs> um, so, Solemnity is the really big feast. When else? The littler feasts. <laughs> the ones we call feasts. You have different levels of celebration. One is kind of the ordinary day. Then you have you know, the Advent and Lent. And then you have saints' days. And some saints' days are optional memorial. You can celebrate it, but you don't have to. Other saints' days, you have to celebrate them. Like today, Feast of Timothy and Titus. And then there are some that are feasts. Feast days. They're not memorial. They're up a little bit. Trinity, again, it's a Sunday. But well, Pentecost is a solemnity. I'm thinking yesterday. Yeah. Let's go to our trusty sacramentary. Today was Timothy and Titus. Who were Timothy and Titus? They were bishops. Yes. One was in uh, Ephesus, and one in, as you say, Greek. And they were Something. disciples of Paul. Exactly. They were, he was, Paul was their mentor. And today is a memorial. It says it right there. Memorial. Well, lo and behold, what does it say here? Conversion of St. Paul, the Apostle. Feast. So yesterday we would have done, or we did, the Gloria. Today we don't because it was a memorial. What about one of these feast days or one of these solemnities that fall during Advent or Lent? For example, the Immaculate Conception always falls during Advent. The Annunciation commonly falls during Lent. Do we do the Gloria? Yes. How many of you say yes? How many of you say no? How many of you are afraid to vote? <laughs> Chickens. <laughs> <laughs> what happens if you vote wrong? <laughs> I don't want to say on camera. <laughs> yeah. 
Yes, we do. Okay? Because it's a solemnity, it overrides the season. So, pardon? Is that what it? So that would be a good way to describe it on the more festive celebrations. Okay. Uh, now, we move from the Gloria, you then have the opening prayer, you have the readings, you have the homily, and then what do we have after the homily? Pardon? Ooh. Creed. The creed, which we're going to look at next week. And then what do we have? Prayers of the faithful. Prayers of the faithful, don't we? Okay. are one of the least understood parts of the Mass. We think because the prayers of the faithful were the faithful that this is our prayer, and yes it is, to a certain extent, it is. That does not mean it does not have structure. Before our session this evening, there were three of you that volunteered to read uh, about half sheets of paper. Uh, one has one on the back of it, one has two, and one has three. Uh, you have one? Okay. Um, here. Would you read slowly the petitions? I want you to hear. These, these are from a resource that I use for Mass, uh, for the prayers of the faithful. These, oftentimes you're going to hear these things on Sunday. I think the, some of these, you, is it this next Sunday, you may hear some of these same ones as I took from there. That the faithful may be bold in sharing about Christ and the salvation we have through him. That those who set economic policies may be aware of and responsive to the suffering of those in need. That those who suffer from physical and mental disabilities may find strength in the Lord in support from caring people. That we in this parish may open our minds and hearts to receive the word of God and allow it to take root and grow steadily in our lives. Quiz number two. For the church and its leaders and the faithful may strive always to imitate the love and compassion of Christ. For civil authorities that they may in all things Seek to build a world in keeping with the dignity due all human beings. For those troubled by physical or economic adver adversity, that they may be moved to seek solace in God and turn to Him in prayer. For our faith community, that God's love may be manifested in how we interact with all those we encounter. Who has number three? that the church's untiring efforts to help those in need may be a witness that helps bring many to know Jesus. That all people may recognize the sanctity and dignity of human life from the moment of conception until natural death. That those who do not yet know Jesus as their Savior 
may open their hearts to him, and let the Holy Spirit guide them to salvation. That each of us gathered here may know and be grateful for the many ways God touches and guides our lives. What did you hear as you were listening to those prayers? What is the structure? Yeah. The first one is the church. What is the second one? Now this one, there's a little bit of a curve, because I threw a little bit of a curve in, I think it was the, the second or third one. What? It seems like they're always related to the government. Yeah. We're talking about the official civil authority. Some, can you read your that those who suffer from physical and mental disabilities may find strength in the Lord and support from caring people. So I'm healing. Well, what is your third one? That those who do not yet know Jesus as their Savior may open their hearts to Him and let the Holy Spirit guide them to salvation. Is there an individual? Yeah, it's it's an individual need. It's, but it's not a local individual need, a more global. So we're looking at um, kind of that global need, not specific, more general, a burden, you know, mental illness. There are people, not just in Caledonia, there are people throughout the world. We're praying not only for ourselves, are we? Look at these first three. These are not local. We're praying for the universal church, not for the church in Caledonia or even in Grand Rapids or even in the United States. Read again, um, if you would, uh, Pete, One. your first that the faithful may be bold in sharing about Christ and the salvation we have through Him. Who are the faithful? Christians. Christians. Just in Caledonia? No. What is your first one, Wally? That the church's untiring efforts to help those in need may be a witness that help bring many to know Jesus. Who's the church? Us? Just us? Your first one. For the church, that its leaders and the faithful may strive always to imitate the love and compassion of Christ. Okay, again, the church. Church doesn't exist just in California, just in Grand Rapids. Okay? So the first three are very broad, very universal. What about the fourth? Yeah, the fourth is local. If there is a flood in Mississippi, where does that one go? Pardon? Is that a global need? Pardon? It's local to Mississippi. Well, it's, it's a local need, isn't it? For the people of Mississippi who have suffered this flood. Isn't that usually the way we word those sorts of things? We don't, now, we may pray. There is a way that we can globalize it. For the people of Mississippi who have suffered flood and for all victims of flood throughout the world, okay? I would still put it here because you're starting with the local. Okay. Local doesn't necessarily mean Caledonia. Okay. 
It can. In fact, one of them, didn't one of you have something for the parish? Yeah. For, okay. We're, 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 that we in this parish may open our minds and hearts to receive the word of God and allow it to take root and grow steadily in our lives. Okay. Like mission. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, where do we put the ones for disciples and mission? We always put them down here because it's a local need. Okay? So we go from the church, universal, down to the specific. Now, does that mean we only have four petitions? No. Once you get to this point, you can add others. Which one didn't you hear tonight that we usually have on Sundays? Yeah, the deceased. Okay. Do you have to have one for the deceased? No. Why not? Well, you don't have to. There, there's nothing that says the intention for the Mass has to be announced. And some of the Masses are not for a deceased person. Do we have to have a petition for the deceased? Yes? No? How many of you say no? How many of you say yes? We don't. And why not? It's okay. They're in a better place. Well, hopefully, <laughs> there are some that need prayers, trust me. Why don't we have to put one in there for the deceased? Does that mean we're not praying for the deceased? It's in the mass. It's in the mass. Yeah, it's in the Eucharistic prayer. We pray for the dead. In the Eucharist, we pray for the living, and we pray for the dead. So we don't have to. We commonly do. Okay? But just so that you know, if one Sunday you don't hear something for the deceased, doesn't mean, well, I guess we got to go to church somewhere else. This Mass was invalid. We didn't mention the deceased. No. <laughs> we, why? It was your cue to. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> that, that, that's their idea. Yeah, well, actually, I. The I know ahead of time what the, what the prayers are. Oh. So, I. Now, that being said, sometimes I forget which one. So, yes, that's helpful. It does. Help. Yeah. <laughs> I knew it. <laughs> but that was a local thing. Yes, yes that was a, exactly. It was very. It's very local. Restricted to. <laughs> There's one more that sometimes we see in parishes. The ones about the silence. Yeah. Uh, let us now pray in silence for, for, uh, for those prayers and petitions that we find in the quiet of our hearts. Okay? That's common. But it's not part of these four, is it? Do we have to put that one on there? What would be a reason to not put it on there? Please, stand up and say that loud. Well, because, folks, this is very, very important. We did it in the beginning with the collect, when we come and we're silent before Mass and we're praying. So we're bringing our prayers then. It's already been done, isn't it? Let us pray. Silence. That's when we're supposed to bring all of those things that are in the silence or in the quiet of our hearts. Why are we waiting until the prayers of the faithful? What does the prayer of the faithful do? What, what, what is its signal? Do you have... Okay, take it. You're good. So what does the prayers of the faithful uh, uh, signal? Exactly. The end of the liturgy of the word. We then move into what? The liturgy of the Eucharist. 
That's where we get the offer. Money, 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 money. You can tell Pete spent a lot of time on stewardship committee. <laughs> um, I, I want some of the bulge under his left armpit as he was taking up the collection. <laughs> <laughs> well, I couldn't pick on Lyle anymore, so I figured yeah. I had to find something else. Um, so, if you think about it, why would we want to wait until the end of the Liturgy of the Word to bring our prayers and petitions forward? Why wouldn't we want to bring them at the beginning of the Mass? And the place is there for it. Again, you see how a lot of times it's, it's a question of not us not understanding the liturgy that leads us to do, and this is true of priests. Priests oftentimes don't understand the liturgy sufficiently. So we fall into these bad habits because good intentions. We want, for example, people to have a, a, a place for them to bring their petitions. And so we stick this in to the prayers of the faithful, and week after 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 week, it's the same petition. The prayers of the faithful never intended to, to have the same petitions week after week after week. But we couldn't figure out any other way to do this because we didn't understand, really, the collect is the place collect these prayers. Okay. Does that make sense to you folks? Because I think that's important. Yes? It, it makes sense to me there because you don't want to come you don't want to come to Mass and mainly start asking God for stuff if you want to begin with praise and glory and, and then work your way up to the point where you know this makes sense, this is where we're going to now ask God for our, our kids. Yes. Yes. That's a good point. We get ourselves in right relationship with God, the penitential act. We hear the word of God. And now, in a sense, we're responding. That's why these change every week. We try to make them correspond to the readings and the themes, uh, as well as any specific need. Uh, the idea is we've prepared ourselves, we've been prepared to bring these petitions to the Lord that have been prepared based on the specifics of our liturgy. Uh, I had a whole bunch of other stuff, but it looks like we're not going to uh, get to it because I don't want to keep you too late. Um, any Questions or comments about this evening? What we're talking about? Yes. I just have one comment. I have to share it. Uh -oh. Rosie said to me, she was she's really excited about she wouldn't say this side do it. <laughs> <laughs> she's really excited about this the, the new translation because it directly translates from what she learned. In Spanish. in Spanish, yeah, and you know, I really think that drives home the whole point—a big point of why we're why we're in the, doing all of this—is because we are the, the universal church. We ought to be able to, you know, all of our brothers and sisters from any language, and it, and it, and it does come from the Latin. So I, I just thought that was just a, a really important thought process. Yeah, and I think that's true because then we're not praying. Go back. What have I been saying? We're not praying similar things. We're praying the same thing. Okay? And again, I see in this new translation, I echo that sentiment. In fact, one of the things I was going to do tonight, but I realized there's only so much you can do in, in a session. I was going to show you the Italian, the current Italian Gloria versus our current one versus the new one. You will see that, you would have seen that it's much more like the one we're moving to, and the Spanish is clearly the same. Yes, sorry. I think um, on the same note, the 
previous translation that has said the church liquid steel mm -hmm. um, also had drawbacks because if you went to Australia, the translation was different. Yes. If you go to Ireland, the translation was different. Uh -huh. Yes. If you go to Canada, United States, it depends which diocese or <coughs> diocese is different. Mm -hmm. So having this international body together to come up with a standard revised version is just like the Latin mm -hmm. before Vatican II. Because whether you were French, Spanish, Italian, wherever you went in the world, you understood what was going on during the months. Mm -hmm. So to have a standard English translation, I think, is a blessing in itself. Well, one of the, along that same line, I remember when I was in L.A., my very first assignment. There are a lot of Spanish-speaking people, and there are a lot of masses in Spanish. They had a Spanish missalette. You know what the missalette is? Okay, it has all of the readings and the prayers and all of that. My understanding was, from the priest, the only sacramentary they could get was from Spain. They couldn't get it from Mexico. I don't know why. The Missalettes, on the other hand, were the translation from Mexico. And there was a difference. I can uh, remember stories of priests celebrating Mass out of the Missalette and I'm saying, oh! <laughs> you know, this disposable thing, you book that you throw away and you're using that for Mass. But I guess in some respects, what else can you do? So now there's one English translation, one Spanish, one German so if you go to Ireland, you go to Australia, you, uh, Australia, you go anywhere after the first Sunday of Advent, you're going to be familiar with it. Yeah. Okay? Yes? Along those lines, are they ever going to standardize the scripture readings too? Because those, because when I was in Ireland, they did a different translation. How long ago was that? Oh, gee, about five, six years ago maybe. Okay, because I know there was some work. I thought they were... They had done that already. It says in the book they're working on it right now. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Clearly, I didn't read the book closely. <laughs> you read the teacher's well, version. Well, I did. Yeah, I read the teacher's version. I didn't. Well, well, there, well, there's another point to that. And that's that's the, not the peon version. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's, it's, sometimes there's things from the mass that are out of scripture, but then the scripture yes. reading is different. You see what I'm saying? Exactly. Yeah. And but we're going to see. More of the stuff that we're hearing in Scripture, you're going to hear it sound a lot similar to what we're having Mass. One of the perfect examples, I think I uh, shared with you at the end of Mass uh, a few months back, when the priest holds up the host, this is the line of God, and takes away the sins of the world, happy to those who are called to a supper. You respond, Lord, I am not worthy to receive you, but only say the word and I shall be healed. No one knows where that came from. But it's scriptural. Lord, I'm not worthy for you to come under my roof, but only say the word and I will be healed. Do you know where that one comes from? Centurion. Exactly. We know right away. It's the centurion. And that's exactly, that's what we're going to be moving to, is that translation. Because, oh Lord, I'm not worthy to receive you. That was... It was based, but it was kind of a dynamic, loose translation of that whole thing. So what got lost in that was the scriptural connection. So what we're doing now with the new translation is we're reconnecting it to the scripture. So that when we hear that, it's like, yes, the centurion. Okay? All right, I have... It says points to ponder, but there's actually only one point to ponder. Um, again, what I ask you to do is not just ponder, but talk about it. Your family, your friends. Um,
No? You better, you better have it memorized. Actually, do you know one of the reasons why we're doing the chant now? Do you know why we're, we're using the chant? Somebody recite for me your ABCs. I'm hearing. Could it be music? <laughs> One of the ways we learn things is through song. through song. Okay? So that's one of the reasons why we're doing the chant. To help us learn the words. Okay? We're making that connection. We will have cheat sheets. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I may be cruel, but even I am not that cruel. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> except for Lyle. Uh, yes, except for Lyle. Um, we don't know the final um, format. That's why we're doing it this way. Because there's going to be all kinds of things printed up out there. So rather than reinvent the wheel, we'll probably buy pew cards um, with a chant on it. So, um, again... They haven't been printed yet, so we don't, we haven't made our selection, we can't make our selection until they print them, so that's why we're doing it this way, but we, there will be something in the pews. Okay? All right, why don't we tonight conclude our session with the hymn of praise, but we'll recite it. Let's do the new translation. In the name of the Father, yeah, it's on page 14. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Glory to God, God in the highest, and on earth peace to people of goodwill. We praise you, we bless you, we adore you, we glorify you, we give you thanks for your great glory. Lord God, heavenly King, O God, Almighty Father, Lord Jesus Christ, only begotten Son, Lord God, Lamb of God, Son of the Father, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. You take away the sins of the world, receive our prayer. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, have mercy on us. For you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. Amen. In the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, one quick question before you leave. Um, do you have a preference between technology and high technology and low technology? Is there any... What you did. Okay, that's why I want to make sure everybody can see this stuff. This is this is my preferred way of doing it, but you and, know and the print really nice. Fun. Yeah. <laughs> no, we want you to text us. We're all oh, yeah. <laughs> I remember a cartoon one time it showed a preacher up at the pulpit and he's typing in there. Can I get an amen? <laughs> They're all with their computers and the pews. <laughs> all right. Thank you, folks. Thank you, Father.